Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mission Bio's virtual event, Do More Single Cell with Less, Tapestry Platform Expansion for Hematologic Malignancy Research. Uh, we're gonna share some exciting new updates on the Tapestry platform. Joining us today, we have our speakers, Dr. Koichi Takahashi, Associate Professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we also have Dr. James Flynn, Senior Product Manager at Mission Bio. A couple of reminders before we start. We're currently recording this session and live streaming on YouTube. And throughout the presentations, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Zoom chat or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end of all presentations. And with that, I'll hand it over to Koichi. Please go ahead. Do you see my slides okay? We do. Um, yes. If you want to actually put it in the presentation mode. Oh, it's still not in the presentation mode. Okay, give me one second. I think I need to share this screen. How about this? That's great. Okay. Uh, thank you, MJ. Um, my name is Koichi Takahashi. I'm a, a physician scientist at MD Anderson and Today I'm talking about the clonal heterogeneity and the clonal evolution in AML, um, which are mainly uh, get revealed by this tapestry platform. Uh, so just a quick outline about what I'm gonna talk today. Um, I'm going to go over some of the background about the clonal heterogeneity overall in cancer and also AML and the recent methodological advancement in measuring the clonal heterogeneity and especially talking about the single cell DNA sequencing technologies and also biological implications of revealing these clonal heterogeneity and evolution in AML. And finally, some of the clinical implications of uh, understanding clonal heterogeneity and evolution in AML. So uh, this is really um, not needed um, so much, but uh, there's an important distinction between the intertumor heterogeneity versus intratumor heterogeneity. So these DNA sequencing um, effort in large cohort of cancer patients, including AML, had really revealed a number of driver mutations that is involved in uh, these cancer developments and leukemia development which also uh, revealed this remarkable intertumor heterogeneity, or in other words, um, the heterogeneity of each patient, um, that um, each patient have a different uh, genetic profiles. And this understanding that what genetic profile that your, your patient has, um, has a huge implications in terms of the treatment decision-making uh, these days, especially if your mutations is actionable. However, also in a single individual patient, there is also a heterogeneity exists inside your patient's tumor. So if you take a bone marrow biopsy from your patient, actually by morphology, all the cells look similar. They all look very, um, you know, the same. However, if you analyze each, each single cell carefully, you actually notice that there is a lot of diversity and heterogeneity among each cells, which can be genetic, genetic heterogeneity or phenotypic heterogeneity, and also could be epigenetic or transcriptomic uh, heterogeneity. And today I am mainly focusing on this genetic heterogeneity uh, across each individual uh, leukemia cells. And today I don't talk much about this, but uh, there's also an increasing interest in revealing this spatial heterogeneity um, uh, in, in your um, cancer cells. And this has been um, actually not investigated very well in leukemia field, but this has been increasingly well um, understood in the solid tumors field as well. And why, why is it so important to understand this intra-tumor heterogeneity or the clonal heterogeneity of your patient? 
because there's both uh, biological and clinical implications um, by understanding intratumor heterogeneity. Actually, your bone marrow or your um, cancer specimen is uh, a very diverse population of different cell state, which consists this uh, tumor ecosystem. And understanding this tumor ecosystem has increasingly important to understand also um, how these, how your um, actually tumor um, tumor environment is um, created, uh, including both the tumor cells and also the micro environment and how they respond to your treatment, especially the immune mediated treatment. And also uh, clonal heterogeneity or intratumor heterogeneity is a consequence of the evolution. Um, so understanding or describing intratumor heterogeneity accurately, as much as accurate you can, you actually are able to also draw inference on how the tumor got evolved. Um, and this also has a strong biological implication how your um, cancer uh, or the tumor develop um, through the understanding of this intratumor heterogeneity. From the clinical side, um, uh, describing the intratumor heterogeneity or colonal heterogeneity has strong implication about predicting the therapy resistance and as well as the overall clinical prognosis, which has been um, previously um, shown in the multiple uh, publications. There are several uh, or multiple methods to measure intratumor heterogeneity well. And you know, most classical way is by morphology. Even though the cell, each cell may look like similar, if you look very carefully, pathologists have has actually um, noticed that each cell look a little bit different by morphology. So uh, hematopathologist or the um, solid tumor pathologist has historically been describing these morphological heterogeneity just which can be just observed by the microscopic um, evaluation. Flow cytometry is also a single cell analysis tool which can immunophenotypically uh, describe the um, heterogeneity um, across your um, samples. And recently, um, increasing, we are increasingly using this molecular platforms or the single cell platforms to describe this intratumor heterogeneity, uh, which is uh, the focus of today's um, talk mainly. Um, so um, the next generation sequencing actually uh, really initially revolutionized the way of describing this intratumor heterogeneity. Although it has some limitation, it does decent job of describing intratumor or clonal heterogeneity. You have an AML sample in front of you, you smash it and extract the DNA um, from the specimens, and then you perform the NGS sequencing, which gives you this um, information about the varying allele frequency of each mutation. For example, the NMT3A mutation being 40% VAF, followed by NPM1, FLIP3, ITD, and NRAS. And just by these information, there are a number of computational algorithms that will help you deconvoluting this uh, clonal architecture or intratumor heterogeneity. For example, like a pike clone or site clone or expands algorithm. These algorithms all help to deconvolute these um, bulk NGS data and try to identify uh, or try to kind of um, tease out how many clones or subclones you have in your specimens. And this is, uh, this is kind of the process where um, it's a lot of times um, kind of referred to as you know, blender theory or the smoothie theory, where you have in original ingredients of fruits, which you blender. It's like an, smashing your samples and extracting the DNA out. And then perform the, uh, the NGS sequencing is like trying to um, I, understand the ingredients um, of the, that smoothie, what, what, what is the percentage of each ingredient. And again, uh, this type of bio, bioinformatic or deconvolution uh, process does a decent job in identifying the clone numbers or identifying the uh, clonal structure of your tumor. However, uh, the bulk sequencing can do as much uh, as they can do from the data uh, itself. And you, uh, although you can actually try to understand the hierarchy of your mutation composition and draw the inference of what is the uh, hierarchical structure of your tumor, you can almost never, um, unless you have a longitudinal or multi-site um, sequencing data, you can almost never really tell uh, the most kind of important subclonal architecture of your tumor specimens. Um, more specifically, whether your subclonal mutations are um, in a branching structure or is it 
truly in the linear structure or not. You can probably tell that if you have a longitudinal specimens. Um, however, if you only have a one time point specimen, this is extremely difficult to understand with, if you only have a, a bulk uh, NGS uh, sequencing data. So the idea was to, why, why don't we just sequence individual cells one by one? And this is this sounds a very simple and very attractive strategy by conception. However, there is a many technical challenges uh, associated with this single cell uh, DNA sequencing. First is how to isolate each single cell. Um, traditionally, flow cytometry has been used to isolate each cell individually. This is labor intensive, and unfortunately, it's low throughput because you essentially manually sort each single cell one by one. Uh, recent platforms uh, such as this Mission Bio platforms and other um, kind of uh, devices have increasingly using this microfluidic device uh, to isolate each single cell, which which helps the throughputness, but also have some kind of unique um, limitations like the doublets or the multiplet. Quantity of uh, the actual DNA content in each single cell has been also the challenge in the, from the technical challenge. Each cell technically has only two copies of DNA. Uh, unlike RNAs where multiple copies exist in each single cell, there's only two copies of DNA. So amount of DNA, absolute amount of DNA is just too small for, uh, for sequencing, uh, for the single cell sequencing. So therefore, uh, historical method had inevitably had to use this um, genome amplification technique, like a whole genome amplification technique, which has lots of false positive uh, issues or the false negative issues from the allele dropout, which is summarized in this um, uh, excellent review by Nick Navin um, in Molecular Cell 2015. Also, um, there is, this is a little, somewhat unique to the single cell DNA sequencing, which is an accessibility issue that DNA is uh, tightly compacted inside the chromatin in the nucleus and accessing DNA um, for each single cell has been technically challenging compared to RNA, which usually is in the cytoplasms. Therefore, um, um, there, had, uh, there has been a number of the uh, historical studies uh, using the single cell um, DNA sequencing in AML. However, those studies have some limitation in the cell throughputness or also require whole genome amplification, which can kind of have introduced these artifacts or the false negatives. This is not the exclusive list of all the uh, historical studies, but I'm showing some representative studies of single cell uh, genotyping in AML using the conventional methodologies like flow sorting isolation, followed by whole genome amplification or the amplicon um, amplifications. And as you can see here, uh, some studies have limitation in the cell throughputness um, or the number of genes that they were able to interrogate because of um, these um, limitations. And these um, limitations kind of um, led to this um, historical nature that single cell RNA sequencing has been uh, commercialized earlier than the single cell DNA sequencing because there is this unique limitation in the single cell field um, about the accessibility and also the low quantity issue about the single cell DNA that um, single cell RNA sequencing was technically more easier to um, commercialize. And therefore, it was no surprise that the 10x genomics or the other platforms got commercialized earlier than the single cell high throughput uh, platform like Emission Bio. However, we were um, extremely fortunate uh, that we were able to collaborate with the Mission Bio at early time point where they had developed this um, platform, which enables this high throughput on um, single cell DNA sequencing, um, seq sequencing. We published this in the genome research around 2018, where we went over the technical principles of how we make this happen to improve the accessibility by adding this protease K into this protocol, which dramatically improved the access to these um, uh, genome site at single cell level. And with the, their, their molecular barcode and the microfluidic um, devices, the throughputness of um, this platform uh, was dramatically better com compared to the historical um, platform. For example, in this table where we are showing that with each run, we were able to genotype roughly 5,000 to 7,000 cells for a number of um, uh, driver genes. 
And using this platform, um, now that there are, are uh, three and even more um, uh, publications uh, out there, I'm um, using this platform to uh, genotype uh, AML samples in a large scale. Um, these three papers um, and other papers more or less show very similar results. So I will take the liberty of just introducing our own studies, um, but please read other um, group studies, which really remarkably show the reproducible and the very similar results um, among all the studies. So in our um, studies, uh, we performed a large scale unbiased single cell genotyping of AML of about 123 AML patients um, samples. We initially used the 19G panel that uh, Mission Bio had commercialized um, uh, in the beginning. And also we, uh, later time we used, we developed our own custom design panels, which, in, uh, which uh, involved a 30, which covered the 38 genes of the 38 driver genes in AML using this 290 amplicons. Um, and since this technology was relatively new, we, we thought that we needed orthogonal validation of these mutation calls and also the zygosity calls. So we concurrently perform the bulk NGS or the DDPCR to validate each uh, single uh, mutation that we detected from the single cell platform. And also we perform the SNP array to, uh, in the selected samples to validate some of the zygosity calls. Some of the quality control metrics using this platform, I, I really want to um, say that this platform is a very um, highly reproducible and um, extremely um, uh, produced kind of a very a good quality data. And each time when we run, the data is very reproducible. And median from our uh, experience, we were able to genotype roughly 6,000 cells uh, per run, which I know was the updated platform now that the cell throughness has improved, which we may hear uh, later from James. James, um, in our uh, experience, we were able to do about 48x uh, depths uh, per amplicon per cell, which we think is a very good um, sequencing depth as a single cell DNA sequencing. Again, technically, each single cell only have a two copies, or if you do a 48x coverage, technically, you are sequencing each allele 24 times, which we think is a very good uh, sequencing depths uh, for reli reliable genotyping. And there is a very good BAF uh, concordance between the bulk uh, sequencing variant early frequency and the single cell DNA sequencing variant early frequency, which tells us that even though you're only sequencing 6,000 cells from your sample, it is a good representation of your entire bulk um, samples. An estimated allele drop prof dropout from that um, platform was around 5.8%, which was much better than the historical. Um, whole genome amplification involved uh, platform. And what was gratifying to see was that uh, there was 100% concordance between, or 100% uh, of the mutation that was detected by the single cell DNA sequencing were validated using the either the bulk sequencing or the DDPCR when you um, use the, um, the cutoff of 0. Point, um, I'm sorry, the 1.0% um, cellular population. And in fact, the single cell DNA sequencing detected more uh, mutations, especially in the FLT3 ITD um, compared to the bulk um, NGS. And bulk NGS has notoriously been bad, especially if you use this capture enrichment system uh, for detecting the ITD mutations. So uh, this was something that um, single cell DNA sequencing did better job um, compared to the bulk NGS uh, when you use the capture enrichment um, system. And we also later learned that if you do the 250 paired and sequencing, you have better detection of FLT3 ITD, which is some you know, technical um, uh, part, um, but compared to 150 pair N, uh, it, it does a much better job of detecting ITD uh, detection. And when you run these um, single cell DNA sequencing platform for each sample, you get this type of heat map for each sample, which tells us what is the mutation co-occurrence and the mutual exclusivity across all these single cell um, for, the, for your driver gene list. And we started to see this interesting observation that um, some of these functionally redundant oncogenic mutations are mutually exclusive at the, at the cellular level. For example, in this sample where the FLT3 mutation and NRAS and KRAS, multiple NRAS and KRAS mutations were mutually exclusive at the cellular level, 
um, which was also similar in other cases, for example, this KIT mutation and the FLT3 ITD mutation, or this IDH1 mutation and IDH2 mutation in this case. And on, in this uh, first case, where we also saw this mutual exclusivity between this FLT3 tyrosine kinase domain mutation and the ITD mutations. And all of these observations kind of inform us that uh, functionally redundant mutations are mutually exclusive at the cellular level, which might implicate that actually having two or more mutations um, of the similar functional mutation, for example, this NRAS and KRAS mutation might be deleterious to this, um, or it's not a, that does not provide a selected advantage to the cancer cells, and therefore it becomes mutually exclusive, or it's just sufficient to only have these um, type of mutation in um, one per, per cell. And therefore we, all, we see this type of uh, mutual exclusivity at the cellular level. And now that you get this type of heat map um, at the single cell level, how can we reconstruct the clonal evolution pattern um, from these type of maps? For that, we collaborated with the ETH Zurich people who had developed this algorithm called SITE, which was exclusively designed to uh, infer the clonal evolution pattern based on the single cell genotyping data. And using this platform, we were able to reconstruct um, all of our samples for the um, clonal tree. And uh, among the 123 samples, half of them exhibit the linear clonal evolution pattern like this. But while the other half of the, pa uh, the patient had this branching evolution pattern like this. And among these branching evolution patterns, we also observed interesting cases like in conversion evolution patterns. For example, this case had a multiple parallel evolving clones, which essentially contains the same similar combination of the mutations like NPM1 plus IDH followed by FLT3 or MAP kinase pathway mutation. And this is similar to what uh, uh, other investigators have observed in other solid tumors, like in the renal cell carcinoma, where they have uh, used this uh, multi-site um, sequencing to identify this conversion evolution pattern, in this case, with the set D2 mutation in multiple areas of the mutations. And using this um, clonal uh, inference of this mutation uh, tree, we are now able to identify what is the order of the mutation that was acquired in your AML samples. For example, in this sample, we think that ASX1 mutation was acquired first, followed by SRSF2 and RUNX1 and IDH2. And understanding this mutation order at the precise level seems to be maybe important in AML um, biology too. And we got inspired by this paper in myeloproliferated neoplasm where uh, using the single colony sequencing technologies, they had um, identified two patterns in the myeloproliferated neoplasm, which start with TET2 mutation followed by JAK2 mutation or the vice versa that you start with JAK2 mutation and then acquire TET2 mutation. An interesting that UK group have found was that depending on what mutation you started with, actually the cl clinical prognosis and also the clinical phenotype was significantly different in myeloproliferative neoplasms. So we also tried to see if this similar uh, phenomenon might happen in the AML too, if the mutation order might, might dictate some of the clinical phenotype or not. In AML, this, this work turns out to be a little bit more complicated because there are multiple, uh, many more driver mutations are involved. But when you summarize the initiating mutation, the number of fir the first mutation that started in your AML sample, um, most of the initiating mutations are the mutation that we expected as a clonal hematopoiesis, for example, DNMP3A or TEC2 or ASXL1. But also in some of the AML samples, you actually start with these signaling mutations like NRAS or FLT3 mutations. And when you summarize the mutation order pattern in acute myeloid leukemia, at least in 123 AML samples that we have analyzed, there's a very diverse um, pathway for AML to have in terms of the mutation order. There is definitely a uh, you know, most likelihood mutation pattern exists like DNMP3A followed by NPM1 or FLT3, which I'll know that is the most common kind of the trajectory but that's really not the dominant feature of AML that there is multiple other diverse pathways for AML to have when you analyze this mutation order in 123 AML patients. 
if you focus on these rare cases which started with the RAS mutation or the FLIP3 mutation, at least we have observed that in these RAS first AML or RAS pathway first mutation AML, we saw that um, there is some increased monocyte counts in both um, bone marrow and also the peripheral blood, which might suggest that RAS first AML have a monocytic phenotype, which also goes along with the observation that in monocytic leukemia like CMML or JMML, the RAS mutation has been known to occur as a uh, initiating um, event. So it seems like the understanding of the mutation order de derived from the single cell DNA sequencing might, um, might tell us some, some of these um, clinical phenotype as well. And this work probably will be augmented by um, this recent capability of DNA antibody seq, which the the tapestry now is capable to uh, perform this both DNA and antibody sequencing. We are showing in our paper some of the examples how these DNA antibody technology can help us understanding this genetic and a phenotypic coevolution patterns. For example, in this case where we uh, understood this genetic evolution from the TET2, uh, uh, started with the TET2 initiation and followed by U2AF1, DNMT3A and NRAS mutation, we were able to track the phenotypic evolution along with this genetic evolution. And from these information, we are able to maybe predict or infer what was the tipping point from the pre-leukemic to leukemic transition in this case, we, we think this NRAS mutation acquisition really kind of drive or drove this um, leukemic transformation from the pre-leukemic phase to the leukemic transition. And there's a multiple papers, not, we, we, I'm not showing everything here, but the only the representative ones here that is uh, really um, making this field exciting that this single cell multi-omics capability have really shown this understanding of coevolution of the genetic and uh, phenotype or the, um, or even the transcriptome. In the last minutes, I'm gonna go over um, some of the implication in the clinics um, using this type of technologies. Even with the bulk NGS, if you have a longitudinal sample, you can do a very good job of inferring the clonal heterogeneity and the clonal evolution patterns. However, if you have a single cell capabilities, you're, um, you're, you're able to also infer this um, clonal evolution pattern in much more granular way. For example, in this sample where we were able to tell which precise clone was um, responsible for the AML relapse in this setting with the treatment with the azacitidine and serafinib, where we showed this flip 3 d 835 y clone was, um, um, was preexisted at the 1.7% of the diagnosis, which was clearly selected with this serafinib treatment and later constituted the relapse. And this is very consistent with the in vitro evidence that D835Y clone is resistant to serafinib, while other clone like D835E clone or ITD clone are sensitive to serafinib. And in, in our patient samples, exactly the same thing happened that D835E clone or ITD clone was clearly uh, effectively eliminated by the serafinib treatment, while this D835Y clone was uh, selected with uh, this treatment. And even in the primary refractory patients where you know your blast is 80% from the get-go and after the treatment, it's still 80%. So by just morphology, there's really no change. However, inside your bone marrow, there's a lot of clonal dynamics happening if you do the uh, single cell sequencing and you can understand um, the treatment responses at the clonal level where you will learn a lot from even with the primary refractory patients where certain clones are being treated or the certain clones are being selected with your uh, particular treatment. And this type of um, capabilities have been increasingly applied to the targeted um, treatment um, context where, for example, in the FLT3 inhibitor uh, context or IDH inhibitor context where the selection of these RAS mutated clones seems to be the um, consistent feature of these um, type of targeted um, therapy agents. So in, in future, we are envisioning um, the field where we are able to predict the response to the treatment at the individual clone level. And by the, the composition of what clones you have, your patient have, you may be able to predict what treatment you, um, your patient may become a sensitive or become resistant to that.
And just a summary, single cell DNA sequencing is a powerful tool to determine the clonal architecture, mutation co-occurrence, and also the mutational history. And potential clinical application includes this evaluation of treatment response at individual clone level and clonal mechanism of drug resistance. We couldn't touch so much base, but um, we are also particularly interested in, in the application of this, these technology in MRD setting, in which I'm pretty sure in the next few years that these type of um, application will be published. I wanted to note that clonal heterogeneity is still underestimated with this type of platform because this tapestry is a targeted um, platform. We definitely need a broader coverage of genome uh, while maintaining the thripness in order to understand the clonal heterogeneity at a more a broader level. Um, there is an exciting future opportunities with the multi-omics capabilities with like for, with the PsychSeq or the DAPSeq and also the DNA RNA um, seq. We, uh, I only touched the surface of the DNA antibody seq today, but I'm pretty sure you'll also get an update from the Mission Bio Group how this DAPC capability is expanding um, later on. With that, I would like to end here um, and thank you so much for uh, listening. Great, thank you, Koichi. Um, at this point, I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Let me um, share that screen back. Uh, thank you, Koichi. It was a great talk. Um, very good overview of the platform. I just want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, where Mission Bio is and where we're headed. Um, so just an overview of the company. I think you heard it from the talk is that really our goal is to move precision medicine forward. We're really interested in having a single cell platform that can unlock single cell biology and help the clinicians understand exactly what's going on with a, a patient sample and a guide the therapy and, and, and understand the resistance to uh, different treatments that are out there. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Uh, this is now just looking at uh, our company as uh, Lance. We, we've sequenced millions of cells at this point. Um, so we have a tremendous background of, of different cancer genomes that have been sequenced. Uh, we're well over 34 at this point. Uh, I think that was a number from last year. We're into the, the hundreds of custom panels that we've created uh, for different customers. So there's different, different applications, different um, uses of the, the platform, we can create custom panels for that. We have roughly uh, 800 users on our portal that are using it. And we're over half of the cancer centers uh, in the United States have adopted this platform. We're also internationally, we've, we've significant adoption in, in Europe and Asia as well. Go to the next slide. Just some very high level specs on the platform. Um, what we can do with our tapestry platform is single cell DNA sequencing. As you've seen, we can profile via targeted amplicons um, anywhere from down to just a few amplicons and targeted panels up to about a thousand amplicons across the entire genome. Um, so you can get hundreds of loci uh, that if you're particularly interested in detecting variant changes, copy number changes that happen, rearrangements that happen in the genome, we can do all of those. Uh, we can design a panel to do that. Um, our output is on the order of thousands of cells uh, that get there. So that getting thousands of cells out, you can enable detection of rare clones down to 0.1%. So very few cells that you can detect out of a large population of cells. Um, and we are compatible. I think there was a, a question in the chat. Can we work with cell lines? Yes, we can absolutely work with cell lines. Uh, we are currently enabled to do human, mouse, or if you have a genome set, which is not standard, we can work with that as well. Um, so please do talk to us if you have a project in mind. Um, go to the next slide. I think we'll talk about a couple of capabilities in the platform. We, as uh, I think uh, Koichi pointed out there's a great review article that was written by Nick Navin's lab about the, the things you can do with single cell sequencing. Um, one of them being, can you detect the clonal architecture or substructure of, of the sample population? 
yes, you can do that. You can start to understand the co-occurrence of particular mutations that exist within the sample. Um, you can start to do things like reconstruct the clonal lineage, which I think you just saw in the talk, which was fantastic. You can start to understand the acquisition of mutations as they progress with the disease um, and as they evolve through tumor evolution. Um, and all that made possible by being able to, on a cell by cell basis, detect mutations and understand exactly which ones that co occur in the same subsets of cells. Um, so, if you go to the next slide, um, what we've done recently, um, these are just a couple of updates on the platform, is we've heard customers who have certainly in, in AML and other blood disorders, you have access to a large number of cells where we're headed, where we're going is that often you don't have uh, high numbers of cells. So what we've done is we, we validated the platform down to 20,000 cell input. Um, that does not impact the, the performance of the platform at all. So what we're ex doing is essentially expanding the range of input for the, the cells that go onto the platform. And um, that is not an issue. Um, this is in anticipation of, of getting into different applications that are require lower cell input. So we've been able to conserve precious samples on the platform. And if you go to the next slide, we want to talk about also, uh, we do have catalog content, which is primarily in the heme space, but we do have a tumor hotspot panel, which is focused around hotspots around solid tumors which has uh, been available for a few years now. What we're now offering and has been an expansion to our catalog offering is the ability that some of our, we've had over 30, 40 publications, I believe last year. Um, now we're taking some of those that the, the authors have given us permission and we've made those available to other customers who may wanna follow on in other indications. Um, so we're, we're launching a, acute leukemia lymphoblastic leukemia panel um, from our collaborators at VIB, uh, myeloprophy of neoplasms from Peter Mack in Australia, and myeloid clonal evolution panel from Ross Levine at MSKCC. Uh, in addition to that, we have virtual panels as well. So we have another of, of pre-designed panels that are in a number of different heme indications, which are available. That's, that's a starting point in our design software where you can Start with that panel. You can customize it if you wish or order it as, as is. Um, and then finally, you can completely customize the panel that you want to utilize uh, in our design software, which is available. It's free for anybody to use if they want to sign up and try it. Um, and again, you can make a panel anywhere from 20 amplicons up to 1,000 amplicons on that software. Um, doing it in human, mouse, or any other custom reference genome that you wish to use. Go to the next slide. Um, this is just a couple of slides to highlight these new published panels that we're, we're showing. Um, this is from a paper from last year uh, from VIB that uh, was published in Blood, and they were interested in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so they based this panel looking at all of the most common mutations that are present in Cosmin, as well as other databases, and they've formulated this custom panel. Um, so it is broadly applicable to anybody who's interested in ALL. Um, and their main question was understanding the clonality uh, based by single cell sequencing. And could they utilize that for MRD or minimal disease, residual disease testing? Um, if you go to the next slide. This is a different group, um, also published last year, uh, as you heard. MPN, there's the acquisition of different mutations. What's the order of those acquisitions of mutations and when do they occur? What are the real drivers from the transition from MPN to full on AML? Um, so they, this was a panel they, they were looking at early stage MPN patients and which mutations did co occur in those samples. Um, if you go to the next slide. And then finally, uh, this is a, a really focused panel on just the evolution of myeloid malignancies. 
Um, we do offer an AML panel as a catalog offering and a myeloid panel, which has a much broader spectrum of mutations, which are covered. This panel is a little more focused, a little more looking at just the clonal architecture and evolution of panels. Um, also to note this, as Koichi mentioned, we can pair the addition of antibodies to the panel. So if you look at this paper, uh, this was one where they paired antibodies with the DNA panel to look at both uh, DNA plus protein changes. So genotype to phenotype kind of changes in, in the panel, um, which you can do on the Tapestry platform. And if you go to the next slide, this is an example of the kind of data you can, so you can look at different compartments within the heme lineages. Um, we offer a standard 45 plex panel, which covers all the lineage markers um, present in blood samples. Um, and so you can assess the DNA mutations in conjunction with cell surface markers on there. What we also are highlighting right now is that we've grown our catalog beyond that 45 plex. We now have about 150 total seek D antibodies that are available through BioLegend, who's our antibody partner. Um, and what you can get with that is you can construct your own panel of antibodies to assess what's going on at the cell surface level, as well as assess DNA mutations at the same time. Um, as well as if you have needs for custom conjugates, we can do that as well. So please reach out to us if you have a project in mind um, to do multi-omics on our platform. And I think I have one more slide just highlighting um, what I just mentioned, doing DNA plus cell surface markers. We've had a number of publications come out that year, this past year, looking at therapy resistance, uh, CHIP, clonal hematopoiesis, uh, looking at MRD testing with AML, as Kuichi mentioned, um, that's a focus area for us to understand what is the limit of detection in single cell? Can we assess very rare cell populations? Um, so that's something to look forward to as we keep working on that. Um, and then also looking at resistance and or clonal evolution of cancers in response to treatment is another area of focus for uh, Mission Bio. So with that, I think I will turn it over. I know we have a number of questions, so we'll leave some time to get to that. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to MJ if we have some questions from the audience. All right, um, thank you very much, Koichi and Jim for the wonderful presentations. As a quick reminder, if you have any question, you can type it into the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and I'll see if we have any questions that came in. While you're looking those up, I did see some in the chat. Um, one question was, can we work on cell lines? Yes, we can absolutely work on cell lines. As I mentioned, we can, the ability to work with any custom reference genome uh, that you have. So if you have a, a non-standard cell line, we can, we can certainly work with that. Okay. I think a lot of the questions were answered um, directly in the chat box and the Q&A box. Um, let's see if there were any unanswered questions so far. Okay, this one um, is for Koichi. Um, so what are kind of, can you talk about some of the next uh, key, key questions to address using um, the single cell DNA sequencing technology? Well, I think there are lots of key questions <laughs> and that there's lots of things that we can do or we need to do. Um, I think um, one of the limitations of using at least the current technology is again, the targeted nature of the sequencing. So we are, all, we at least in our work and most of the published work using this platform, we are only covering the known, well-known kind of the driver genes. Um, but with that, we can, we can understand the clonal architecture and at the driver gene level, and also we can understand the clonal evolution um, of the driver genes. Uh, but 
not necessarily the entire uh, kind of level of clonal evolution. Uh, most, more specifically, we can't really, we couldn't infer the time component because we're only capturing the driver mutations. And in order to do, in order to understand the time component, I think we also need to uh, sequence like uh, entire somatic mutations, including the uh, passenger mutation too. And that is something that um, in, in order to do that, but while maintaining the cell throughput is extremely difficult task, but I think that is the next step um, that we are definitely thinking. Uh, that's from the clone evolutional side. Um, I think, again, we, are very, we were very excited about the multi-omics capabilities, which could be either the combination of DNA plus antibody, or, I mean, RNA plus antibodies. The site seek is also producing lots of excitement. And also this DNA and RNA, which are the next really the um, holy grail, um, the, I think the uh, capabilities. Um, I think there are published publications around that you can genotype from the RNA transcriptome. Um, and there are definitely interesting data that is being published, but there's some limitations of doing that. So I think we are genuinely waiting for this pure DN simultaneous DNA, RNA, um, analysis as well. And I'm pretty sure uh, these technology will definitely come on, along. And, and finally, the clinical application side, I think um, we are particularly interested in the MRD uh, application of these platform. And I think those things are the next key questions uh, or the projects, um, which I'm pretty sure there are also a lot of others. Great. Thank you for those uh, perspectives. Let's see. Um, this might be a little bit more um, a technical question. This is one for um, Jim. Um, there, the question is about if the oligos are attached to the heavy chain of the, the antibodies um, and whether they could use the secondaries to find the dilution of the antibody that they're using for the, the multi-omics experiment. Ooh, that's a very technical question. <laughs> I can give uh, an answer. I certainly can provide it if you follow up in an email. Uh, that's a question I'd have to follow up with our friends at BioLegend um, to see. I believe the tag is attached to certain regions, but I can't be specific. I do know that we try to only attach one or two tags to the antibody and then HPLC purify that. Um, so please do follow up in an email we can discuss if that's something of interest. Okay. Um, I think this might be actually a question for uh, Koichi. Uh, so did you apply any cutoff um, for example, a minimum number of cells that a mutation was detected from in order for the mutation to be considered as real? Uh, we didn't apply the minimum cell number, but we definitely applied the minimum um, uh, cutoff of the uh, cell population, which we, in our case, was 0.5%, uh, because that was the lowest that we could verify using the DDPCR, um, at least. Uh, but those are the minimum cutoff of detection. Uh, but if you just use 0.5 person cutoff, there will be also lots of false positives. Um, so filtering out these false positives will be the um, very uh, important task um, computationally. Thank you for that. Um, this is actually a question for Jim again. Uh, is there a way for me to participate in the published panels uh, program? How do I collaborate with Mission Bio on that? Yes, absolutely. As we get more and more publications out there, please do reach out to your local rep. Uh, they will put you in contact with us on the product team. We're looking for additional novel applications out there. Um, so, so yes, um, that's definitely an option if people are interested in collaborating and, and developing panels that could be available to other researchers, we can do that. Great. Um, and then this is, 
I know Koichi, you sort of cover this in the in the presentation, but a question also um, came up. Um, what are kind of your perspectives on the future of single cell DNA profiling going into the clinics, especially in the maybe in the near terms? Yeah, that's a very complicated question, actually. Um, I mean, we are definitely excited about the data that single cell DNA sequencing provides. It's scientifically super nice and it's beautiful. It's no, no question about that. But um, clinical decision making may not, uh, may not need that information at this point, at least. Or in other words, um, we decide the treatment decision uh, or, or I don't know how to describe this very well, but bulk sequencing may able to provide uh, sufficient information at this point in terms of the clinical decision-making. Um, because knowing the subclonal architecture may, may or may not really determine the clinical decision-making at this point. It's, but that's just because our, our treatment uh, is not that sophisticated enough. So uh, that doesn't mean that we should not know these subclonal architecture in a, in a granular level like this. And I'm pretty sure uh, in 10 years or 20 years from now that we are using this type of technology uh, routinely um, because probably at that, but by then our treatment is more sophisticated and we need that level of information. At this point, um, I think bulk sequencing does, you know, provides a good, good enough information most of the times. But so I don't know whether a single cell application of immediate clinical application needs. Um, however, maybe MRD, we, we might have a little bit different opinion. I think MRD might be the most immediate maybe application that we can think of. Great. Um, I think this is a question for Jim. Uh, what is the typical cell capture rate? The typical cell capture rate <clears throat> is really dependent on the sample quality. So obviously, if you have like nice, healthy cell lines that are at a homogeneous population, they'll they'll <clears throat> have a capture rate closer to ten percent. Um, a more degraded sample might be on the range of four to five percent on the platform. It really depends on the quality of the sample. Um, I think we have uh, time for just one more question uh, that just came here um, uh, for, for Jim. What's sort of next for Mission Bio? Anything that um, you can share that's on the horizon? Uh, um, on the horizon, certainly we're going to be expanding our content around heme, but also into solid tumor, and you'll see some updates around uh, sample prep, the ability to take solid tumor samples and put them on the platform, content with that. Um, we're doing a tremendous amount of work in the cell and gene therapy space. Um, obviously, if you have cell material, what you are going to put into a patient, it's very critical that you understand the edits you make to those cells and the safety of those that material. Um, so I think you'll see a, a lot more about that from us. Um, other than that, Koichi mentioned some future looking statements around different analytes, which we might put on the platform. Uh, we have no announcements at this point, um, but that's certainly something to look for in the publications coming out on our platform in the future. Great, thank you. Um, there's one question that came in. I think we have time to just answer for uh, answer that one before we end. Um, and I think it, you know, can be either Koichi or Jim for this one. Um, how long can you preserve a sample before you sequence it for single cell sequencing? Koichi, do you want to take that one based on? Uh, well, we never uh, we never tested how long it can last. So, I mean, in our experience, it can be preserved um, after the library prep, prep, it can be preserved, you know, for a while, um, like a regular um, NGS library. But Jim, you might know a little bit more how, lo how, how, how longest uh, you can test. Yeah, that's a tricky question. Depends on the sample material, depends on how it's prepared. Uh, is, I mean, is it dissociated, not dissociated? Are we talking about cells, nuclei? Or, there's, there's a bunch there. If you have a specific technical need, um, I'm sure we can talk that through with our 
field applications team. Maybe be more than happy to work it out. But uh, in general, if it's a biobank sample, uh, we've seen that generally you can utilize them on the platform if prepared in a way that's that the integrity of the cell material is still maintained. Great. Um, I think that's all the time we have for the questions. Um, if we haven't, uh, for one, able to get to your question, uh, we'll follow up with you after this webinar. Um, thank you, Koichi and Jim again for this wonderful webinar. Um, and thank you, everyone who attended today. For those of you who have registered for the webinar and stayed with us until the end, um, we'll be sending in an Uber Eats voucher. So please be on the lookout for, for an email shortly after this today. And thank you, everyone. And that ends this webinar. Thank Thanks, you everyone, much. for joining. Have a good day.